All right, so I'm recording the objectives of class number two. So in environmental ethics, I, we had a YouTube recording of the first class and it was again my summary because the first class kept breaking up after 40 minutes and it took a while to get started. So I just decided it would make more sense to students if I just give them the general overview. Then the second video related to environmental ethics was the process of writing a post. And I showed you the, what I grade, why someone would get a D, a C, a B, or an A, the sort of demands that I make for students making more connections, being able to connect a certain reading to other classes or to their own experience, personal experience or national experience, whatever. So the more you can take a reading and reflect on it and apply it, contextualize it, learn from it about past, present and future, understand the importance of history, understand the lessons of history and how they lead into where we are today. So all these things are what I look for in your posts. I expect that your posts will get more complex over time. This video is the second video for class number two, and it covers the subject matter and the readings. Um, I'm going to try to spend the last half hour or even hour of the next class talking about Immanuel Kant because we've started to get behind and uh, I'll just do that. You can just uh, expect that, but I won't talk about that right now and I won't expect you to read any of Immanuel Kant. He's hard anyway. So what the topics for today are, I will talk about the short reading uh, of Galileo. I will talk about Francis Bacon. I will talk about John Locke and I will talk about uh, Adam Smith. And then all the way through, I'm gonna relate it to why these ideas have been very powerful and they affect your life because they have been the ideas driving colonialism. The Westerners did not walk around in their heads saying, I'm a racist, sexist, Western superiority bigot, uh, evil person, and I'm gonna go get these people. No, they did not think that at all. They thought, well, we are superior for this reason and that reason, and it's God's will for us to go and exploit other countries' resources and their human resources, their natural resources. It is virtue, justice, and truth. And the Western way is, as a matter of fact, best. So let's figure out how we get to that point. I think by the end of the class, you might at least understand it, even though you don't agree with it. All right, so the first excerpt is from a book Galileo wrote, uh, a dialogue between the two world systems. And he has one of his speakers is Aristotelian and one of his speakers is based on Newtonian science. So this is the switch from Aristotelian science to, to modern science, Newtonian science. It's the switch from um, the value of wisdom to the value of knowledge. It's the switch from valuing the mind as the highest intellectual virtue that's also connected to the moral virtues to valuing our capacity for reasoning as the most, uh, the ultimate 
intellectual virtue that we should have. Um, and it's also valuing um, democracy, right? Over Aristotle just valued a strong and stable middle class. So this might be a monarchy, the rule of one person, as long as the person is just. It might be an aristocracy, the rule of a few, as long as they rule for the benefit of the ruled. It might be a democracy where all the leaders are elected. But Aristotle's idea of the best society is one that combines elected officials with appointed officials and has a strong middle class. Um, all right, so it was always focusing on the middle class, but human flourishing is wisdom, is choosing to do what's right just because it's right for no other ulterior motive. And what's right is defined as whatever enables everyone to flourish as much as possible. Okay, so John Locke, um, switched everything. He has this paradigm shift. So for him, the ultimate values are scientific knowledge, the application of that knowledge for the improvement of human life in the sense of material well-being, okay? Um, his view of God is different from Aristotle in the Catholic Church because his view of God follows from Newtonian science. The big thing about Newton was um, that he created this set of laws. So, so along with Newtonian science was Copernicus. Copernicus uh, changed, shifted the, 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 his theory of what was at the center of the universe. And along with that, the people who sided with Copernicus shifted everything else in culture also. It wasn't just the same old cultural view, except the earth is not in the center. All of a sudden now, it's everything shifts. You throw out everything, start over from a blank slate, okay. So Copernicus' main thesis was that the worldview before that was that the earth is in the center of the universe and uh, everything else revolves around it. Whereas Copernicus said the sun is at the center and the earth revolves around the sun. So it's a radical shift. Now, it's very ironic but Aristotle would have agreed with Copernicus because Aristotle said that the universe is as ordered as possible. And Copernicus, the reason why people uh, preferred his theory was that it, it had a lot fewer assumptions. You could assume a lot fewer uh, presuppositions and it explained the data better and simpler. It was a more simple explanation. And for Aristotle, the universe is intelligible. And so whichever explanation uh, is the simplest and describes the most phenomena with the simplest theory is the one that Aristotle would choose. Um, at the time, the dominant view was Ptolemy's view, which was an explanation of the, the uh, behavior of the other planets. And it was very complicated, right? In order to explain all the phenomena, all the observations. But Aristotle wasn't necessarily Ptolemy, right? But it was associated with Aristotle and so, okay. It's just that Aristotle would have, as a matter of fact, agreed. But, and there were some monks, I'm sure, in the Catholic Church who had studied Aristotle because the monks knew Aristotle very well. Uh, There's some that definitely knew that Aristotle would agree. But the reason why there was this huge animosity 
between um, the scientists and Copernicus and Newton and the religious leaders, the Catholic Church, that also had claimed to understand Aristotle, the reason had more to do with money and power and that the church thought that the masses needed the church to be right. And if the scientists came and caused people to doubt everything the church said, that there would be social chaos and a, and a whole lot of unnecessary suffering. So you have to censor the scientists. Any scientist that comes out and says the church is wrong has to be censored. So that's what happened to Galileo. He, he argues based on evidence that the earth revolves around the sun. That's what the article has that little picture. And he was censored. He was put under house arrest. He was not allowed to speak publicly and not allowed to do any more of his research. But he's just symbolic. Um, the other scientists would either avoid very much public exposure or be punished. But the, in the minds of people from then on, there's this huge gap between religion and science, which is a mistake, okay? And we'll get into that more. It'll become more obvious when we start studying Hinduism and Buddhism and all those religions that valued wisdom they were never, they were not at odds with science. And um, they, they were not even at odds with modern science, except if modern science insists on being reductionistic and then by definition at odds with religion. So for Aristotle, science is about people are driven by ideas, as a matter of fact. And their idea of God is the biggest idea, but it drives them. And it drives their body chemistry. It drives the culture that they create. It drives the facts about culture. But it, it in relation to nature, the good is simply to understand it, not to continually manipulate it. So, um, so that's number one, is that the modern world assumes animosity between religion and science. Um, the second point was Francis Bacon. And I do want you to eyeball those pages. They're sideways. They're just little excerpts. I think I have starred or circled the ones that I usually read in class. I also have another uh, attachment that gives you this little speech that I give where I describe myself as Galileo and I explain what's going on. I describe myself as Bacon and I explain from his point of view. And you don't have to read it, but it does bring out some of the quotes that I think are most important. So if you wanna just look at those and think about them, all right. So the first one is that knowledge is power. The purpose of gaining knowledge of nature is specifically to gain power over nature. That's why you gain the knowledge. Obviously, that's not what Aristotle thought. The purpose of knowledge is to fulfill your natural place as the creature that understands nature. So Bacon knows what he's doing. <laughs> No, it's not to understand, it's to have power, it's to change it for human well-being, material well-being, okay? Um, so that's the, that's the first step. And then point two, yeah, point two, um, and I give you some lessons of history, right? Um, so the point three is just about what can we learn from these patterns that occurred during this big split. Well, first of all, highly educated people get stuck in their belief systems, the systems that give them power and privilege. So they can be smart, but they can be corrupted by greed or power. So the, the monks were the educated people. 
but they were also the people who resisted the change. Um, okay. Eventually, however, the truth comes out, but when people resist necessary changes, they cause all sorts of unnecessary and unjust suffering. Great artists try to educate people about these patterns so that we don't make mistakes that lead to unnecessary suffering. There's plenty of suffering in this world that's just based on our vulnerability, our physical vulnerability, death, you know, there's all sorts of suffering. But when people with smarts are ignorant or blind or corrupt or have good intentions but are wrong, that's unnecessary suffering. So the story in this class is about how false beliefs or partial beliefs have led us to where we are. And where we are is at a place when there, there already is and there will continue to be a lot of unjust suffering because of the ignorance and corruption of the past. However, that shouldn't discourage you. That should actually motivate you. Everything you do makes a difference. Every day when you don't, when you choose to be more wasteful than you need to is a day when the situation gets worse as far as you can control it. Um, again, I, I don't think you should obsess about that and cripple yourself, but I really don't think you should deny it. And I think you should try. That's all, just make some effort. The other thing though, is that I'm sure that my carbon footprint is higher than probably anybody's not because I, I want it to be, but because the situation I live in, the culture is so based on carbon, the use of carbon that it's impossible to function <laughs> um, without using a certain uh, more carbon than I wish I did. And I, again, my country is going to change hopefully by the end of this decade. I certainly hope so. So the conflict, to, um, the conflict between science and religion is still unnecessary and it's causing a lot of suffering. So in my country, there's the people who tend to deny climate science and think it's a hoax. The vast majority base that on some kind of religion and the scientists because of that, because they see this, they tend to get more and more secular and more and more anti-religion. And I don't think, I just think that's a false dilemma, but my students can come out wherever they want to. If some students want to define religion a certain way and define science a certain way and write in a post that that's why they're incompatible, I will read anything and I will at a certain point might say, I just agree to disagree, but I'm not gonna give you a lower grade uh, just because of a conclusion that you come to. I might like your conclusion about something, but you don't give good reasons. And so to me, the reasons matter as much or more than the conclusion because the reasons tell you tell me about your mind. And if you have a good mind, then we can agree to disagree on a certain number of things. And eventually we might, we'll probably agree because if we both are really committed to careful reasoning and to the love of wisdom, we're much more likely to end up in a very similar place eventually. So um, you can give whatever arguments you want. Um, let's see, the next, next point is we move from the specific example of Galileo. Francis Bacon, the excerpts are from his book called The New Organon. Aristotle's works, organon means works, Aristotle's writings were considered the organon. This is the 
ultimate only major authority about the nature of reality. So when Bacon writes his book, he's saying, I'm throwing it all out. Um, all right. There were a few other issues that I talk about in Bacon in the excerpts. There are the four idols, the idol of the tribe. This is all the ways that people's worldviews get distorted and corrupted. And so one of them is just human nature is limited. And so we speculate about stuff that we have no observations of, right? Because we're caught in our little prison <laughs> of our own species. So we have the idols of the tribe, given that we're human beings. We have the idols of our family or the people close to us who tell us stuff that isn't necessarily true. We have the idols of the cave, right? We, we live in, um, we're staring in the wrong place, right? The truth is somewhere else we're ignoring ignorance. And the idol of the theater, the idol of the theater is all these different um, plays, right? Um, so the Aristotelian performance is over here and the, this performance is over here. And, and then the idols of the marketplace is that people will go outside of their own family and they'll go down and they'll just believe whatever they happen to hear. Um, so you can think about how that might apply to, first of all, your own limitations in your experience. Second of all, that your conditioning by the people you know, the people who molded you the most. Um, third of all would be that you that social media, somebody on social media influences your worldview. The influencers, right? There's even a name for these people. Or just the teacher you happen to have or all these sort of accidental circumstances of your life. And then the um, different worldviews that you get exposed to. Um, you maybe again in school or you're reading or something, you read secular humanism or you read um, Islam or you read some view of Hinduism or you read about some other, you know, systems thinking, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy and you just sort of go for it. So those are the various idols that Bacon wants you to get out of your head and just stick the facts. Another big image with Bacon is the ants, the spiders, and the bees. So, the, so he thinks of science as what he calls middle axioms. So on the one hand, the ants just gather data and they put it into a big pile and they don't make any sense of it. They just add more facts. And then the spiders are the ones that have this huge web and every fact that tries to, you know, that, that they take in is stuck in their web. So just to give you an example of how the St. Thomas Thomism that dominated at the time, it tried to explain absolutely everything. And so what it did was it had this view of a supernatural God, the goal of life is eternal salvation, avoiding damnation, but he integrated it with Aristotle. So there's two goals in life. There's wisdom and there's salvation. So um, there, he's, there, he tries to synthesize absolutely everything. He's like a spider right? in the spider web. Every fact you know, gets absorbed into this web. So one example was the question, is the resurrected body, and you assume the body does resurrect, um, does it have blood in it and does it have urine in it? And so St. Thomas had an answer to those questions. <laughs> he had an answer to everything, right? So the answer is the body the resurrected body does have blood in it because that's an indication that it was alive and then it died. It does not have urine in it because 
um, urine has to be produced through life, right? It's a, it's a waste product. So um, it wouldn't have urine in it, okay? Um, especially if you, if you pee right before you die, right? Then it won't have any urine, but it doesn't have to have urine. It will have blood. All right, so that's the idea that he had an answer. And Bacon said, no, that's dishonest. It's intellectually dishonest. We don't know any of that stuff. So all we know is we gather facts like the bees gather pollen and we make honey, which is different than the pollen, but it's based on the pollen. It doesn't go any farther than the pollen. It just literally makes it into a different substance. That's knowledge, okay? Then he does talk about the, the Bible and the nature of God. So he says the Bible tells us God's will for how we should act. It gives us values. Whereas the science tells us God's power, right? The creation. So we learn about the creation just by studying the physical creation. So in the modern world, you have a split between values that are based on faith and facts that are based on science. Again, Aristotle would never split those. He says that scientifically, everything seeks to flourish and that's, it's good. And so you're always asking, uh, how can I act in a way that everyone can flourish. That's your natural necessary value, okay? Goodness, justice, truth, they're all understandable, but they're spiritual values. They go over and above physical, and those ideas are what then you try to use to drive behavior. Um, okay, so the modern world splits facts and values. Um, the next attachment is an excerpt from John Locke. So now we do John Locke. John Locke was a huge influence on American, uh, both its cultural life as well as its um, legal system, the formation, the creation of the constitution, all sorts of things that still has an incredible impact. So that's why we read it. It's, I only have you read three pages. There's somewhat, it's somewhat confusing. It, I think it looks a little repetitive, but just so you, I do want you to get this point. It's about property rights. It's chapter five. Now, the reason it's called the second treatise on government is that Locke was a British guy, lived in England. And his country was based on the divine right of kings. So when the king spoke, he was speaking for God. And, and John Locke goes, no, <laughs> we're, we're going to have elected officials. We're not going to have inherited political power. We're not going to have an entrenched, uh, powerful political class. We're going to have elected officials and those officials we elect legislators who create the laws. That's the most fundamental activity. And then the judicial system applies the laws to particular cases. And then the executive branch executes the decisions made by the justice, the judges and the jurors, okay? So you have three branches of government, legislative, judicial, and executive, the most important is the creation of the laws because the other two are applying and executing. Okay, so this is based on his concept of natural rights. So we have to look at his model of human nature and human culture. He's gonna try to form a whole model of culture based on this new view of human nature and especially of the power of reason. So when I went to college and I read this material, I thought the most important cornerstone is looking at this view of reason. The difference between wisdom in the ancients 
and reason and reasoning in the moderns. But that view itself is related to how we look at nature. So you look at nature as something to understand versus look at nature as potentially something to exploit as long as we gain enough knowledge. And knowledge is our tool to exploit it, right? Um, so I am going to take a break and then I'll come back in a minute. You can reflect on this for a minute. 